graduating at the top of his class with academic honors in science is valedictorian Yuri Manalasa. Hey, who are you guys? Why are you taking my diploma? Hey, hey, come back. Those are the people in my dreams. Okay. They're hunting me. What's the matter, Yuri? He thinks he's seeing ghosts. <laughs> yes, these people might be dead, but they're hardly ghosts. They are scientists who have made significant contributions in the field of biology. And as students, if you really want to learn, you just have to be open-minded to scientific learnings, new and old. Because sometimes, if not most of the time, modern biological issues stem from a study of the past. And this is where progress truly begins. Understanding of the past. Well then, for future ghost science like me, I'd really like to know who these people are <laughs> and what their contributions to science have been. Well, they are Anton Van Leeuwenhoek, Charles Darwin, Louise Pasteur, Gregor Mendel, Rosalind Elise Franklin, Francis Crick, and Barbara McClintock. Well, you'll get to know them better in our session today with Dr. Bio. <laughs> nice! I'm sure these guys will be fun to get to know. And I'm also interested in several fields of biology. Well, I'm pretty sure Dr. Bio will discuss that as well. So, are you guys game for some new learning? Game! Good day, students. Good day, Dr. Leo. Last meeting, we defined biology as the study of living things. Today, we will identify the different fields of biology. We will also discuss the contributions of some scientists in the development of biology. Ma'am, if biology is the study of living things, then that makes it a broad field because there are many different kinds of living things. You are right, Alfonso. That is why biology is subdivided into different fields of study. Botany, which is the study of plants, and zoology, which is the study of animals. But you know, students, there are other specialized fields in biology which were not mentioned. However, the other fields of study which I have discussed are the most important areas of study in biology which answer questions about living organisms. There are several fields of study in biology. They are as follows. Anatomy is the study of the structures of the entire organism and their internal parts. Cytology is the study of the structures and functions of the cell. Ecology is the study of how organisms interact with the environment and with other organisms. Morphology is the study of the gross structures and forms of organisms. Genetics is the study of how traits are inherited and passed on from one generation to the next. Histology is the study of tissues. Molecular biology is the study of the subcellular structures of the cells, particularly the DNA and the RNA. Parasitology is the study of the organisms that live in or on other organisms and the disease they cause. Physiology is the study of how the body and its parts work. Taxonomy is the study of the classification and evolutionary interrelationships among organisms. Evolutionary biology is the study of the origin and differentiation of organisms. 
Embryology is the study of the development and growth of organisms. Paleontology is the study of fossils, the preserved remains, and traces of organisms from the distant past. Microbiology is the study of microorganisms such as bacteria, protozoans, and viruses. Today, some of your classmates will be portraying some scientists who have played significant roles in the history and development of biology. Let us listen to their story. Greetings. My name is Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. At my age of 16, I moved away with my uncle and Ben Pusen to apprentice as a linen draper. But around 1654, I returned to Delft and established my own drapery business. I used lenses to examine cloth for quality, magnifying them up to three times. With my great interest in lenses and no knowledge on how to grind them on my own, I began to make my own powerful lenses. My lenses may be very small, but were much more powerful than those made by anyone else. These were able to magnify up to 300 times. I also made many special microscopes so that I could observe the flow of blood in such things as rabbit's ears, bat's wings, and tadpole's tails. I actually even took samples of black from my own teeth and mixed them with water. And when I look at the mixture through my microscope, I saw many very little living animal cues. These became some of the first recorded observations of what today man would call as bacteria. I was also able to see tiny living creatures in things such as soil and souring milk. These tiny living creatures, I called at that time as little animals, are what you all know now as microbes. I am known to have made over 500 microscopes, of which fewer than 10 have survived up to the present day. I consider that what is true in natural philosophy can be most fruitfully investigated through the scientific method. By diligence and tireless labor, I made with my own hands most certain excellent lenses, with the aid of which I discovered the many secrets of nature, now famous throughout the whole philosophical world. My discovery of the microscope has led to the birth of modern microbiology. I am Charles Robert Darwin, the father of evolution. I am the first evolutionary biologist, originator of the concept of natural selection. I first studied medicine, eventually, I came under the eye of a geology professor and one of the founders of modern geology, Sir Adam Sedgwick. Though Sir Adam Sedgwick guided me in my early study of geology, he was an outspoken opponent of my theory of evolution by means of natural selection. On my return to London, I conducted thorough research of my notes and specimens. Out of these study grew several related studies. One, evolution did occur. Two, Evolutionary change was gradual, requiring thousands to millions of years. Three, the primary mechanism for evolution was a process called natural selection. And four, the millions of species alive today arose from a single original life form through a branching process called speciation. I set these theories in my book called The Origin of Species. My work had tremendous impact on religious thoughts. Many people strongly opposed on the idea of my evolution because it conflicted with their religious convictions by attributing the diversity of life to natural causes rather than to supernatural creation. I gave biology a sound scientific basis. I, Louis Pasteur, am considered one of the fathers of modern biology. This is why I was able to enter the École Normal Supérieure. Have you ever worked with tartaric acid? There was a problem working with it, but I never gave up in finding the solution to that problem. That is why nowadays, tartaric acid is still being continued to be used in laboratories worldwide. Have you ever heard of spontaneous generation? The theory that life can come from inanimate objects? I was able to prove that it was not possible. It was a very hard struggle trying to show everyone that the myth of spontaneous generation was just a myth in itself. I proved to be successful in convincing the rest of Europe that life can only come from life, which is nowadays called biogenesis. My research on this also led up to various discoveries, such as anaerobiosis, 
where microorganisms live and grow without oxygen. You probably have been vaccinated when you were young in order to prevent you from acquiring diseases such as cholera, rabies, or tuberculosis. And that has saved countless lives of humans and animals alike. I also invented the use of antiseptics in medical operations and surgeries. My name is Gregor Mendel. Born in a modest town in Austria, life was never easy for me and my family. But I never let being poor stop my yearning for education. I had to make ends meet by working as a gardener and as a beekeeper. But this all paid back when I entered the Augustinian Abbey of St. Thomas in Brno. Originally named Johann, it was during my stay in the Abbey where I took up the name Gregor. I was sent to the University of Vienna. It was there where I learned about inheritance, the genetic kind. Reading on the works of a biologist under the name Fred Unger, I was impressed with his views on inheritance. And with this in mind, I began performing experiments in biology. Most were done on the common lone pea. This gave me the idea for hereditary units. These units, called genes, come in two categories, dominant and recessive. Offspring inherit genes in pairs, one from the mother and one from the father. The offspring show traits from the dominant gene, while the recessive genes show no results. Ecstatic with my discovery, I decided to publish a journal. But sadly, that journal went unnoticed in the scientific community for years. They said my work had no major impact outside the plant kingdom. Two years after I published my journal, I was elected as abbot of the monastery. But despite my new position, I never gave up on my experiments. Years after my death, my work was rediscovered by scientists. This paved the way for modern genetics. I, Rosalind Elsie Franklin. I schooled at one of the few girls' schools in London who taught physics and chemistry. I excelled in science. And at 15, I decided to become a scientist. One of my tutors, Adrian Whale, was impressed by me and introduced me to Marcel Matthew, the director of the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, which led to my meeting with Jacques Merrin, who taught me X-ray crystallography, my area of expertise. J.D. Bernal, a fellow scientist, called my photographs the most beautiful photographs of any substance ever taken. But in 1952, I was this close to solving the DNA structure. But I was beaten to publication by three men by the names Watson, Cricket, and none other than Wilkins. One day, Wilkins, without my permission, showed Watson one of my crystallographic portraits. When Watson saw the photograph, the solution immediately became apparent to him and the results were almost immediately published. My work was also published, but only as a supporting article. What is clear though, is that I did have a major role in the learning of the structure of DNA. And I was a scientist of the first rank. I moved to J.D. Bernal's lab, where I did my fundamental research on tobacco mosaic and the polio virus. But in the summer of 1956, I became ill with cancer of the ovary. And two years later, the recognition was important no more. I am Francis Crick, an English biologist and English biophysicist. I was born in Western Favel, Northampton, England. I studied physics, chemistry, and biology at Mill High School at the age of 14. Then I received the Bachelor of Science in Physics at the University College of London. In 1949, X-ray crystallography and X-ray diffraction showed that the DNA has a three-dimensional double helix figure. This helped with the discovery within 1951 to 1953, when he first worked with Watson, a close friend of mine, but much younger than me. Subsequently, we were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine, along with Maurice Wilkins. Our efforts bore an incredible breakthrough in science, the DNA double helix. Our continued efforts and research made a great contribution not only in the field of biology, 
but also in the field of physics. Good day. I am Barbara McClintock, born on June 16, 1902 at Hartford, Connecticut. I am the 1983 Nobel Laureate in Physiology and Medicine, an American scientist, and one of the most distinguished cytogeneticists. I received my PhD in Botany from Cornell University in New York, where I was a leader of a developmental study on corn or maize cytogenetics. I studied about corn chromosomes and how they changed during corn reproduction. My work was groundbreaking. I was able to develop a technique in visualizing corn chromosomes, and I used microscopic analysis to demonstrate many fundamental genetic ideas. I demonstrated the role of the centromere and the telomere, the regions of the chromosome which are essential and important in the conservation of its genetic information. I was awarded as one of the best amongst my field, awarded several fellowships and awards, and was also elected as one of the members in the National Academy in Sciences in 1944. After listening to their stories, I hope you have realized that even if these great scientists have made significant contributions to science, just like you, they are very human. They have their fears and frustrations. They get tired, but they also take time out to enjoy life. But what makes them outstanding are their characteristics, such as curiosity, relentless passion to learn, integrity, hard work, discipline, and commitment. I hope that one day, just like them, you too will make significant contributions to society. Surely, we did learn a lot from Dr. Bio today, but apart from those fascinating scientists we came to know, I would like to ask you what the two major divisions of biology are. Hi, Miss Abby. Hello. All right. So, earlier, I asked you what the two major divisions of biology are. Do you know? One is botany, the study of plants. And the other is zoology, the study of animals. I guess that's why they call it the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I guess you really enjoyed our session today, huh? It was pretty cool. I want to be a scientist now, Miss Abby. So do I. Anything you can do, I can do it too. Hey, hey, you ain't serious. I want to be the first Filipino scientist of our generation. No harm in trying. I believe in you. <laughs> I believe in you too, Yuri. And for any one of you who wants to become the next proud Filipino scientist, well, there have been others who have already paved the way for you. So, I'll see you here on K-Hub? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs>